Uh, Any questions? Is, uh, from online students, they, they really wonder how much did you pay for the CLT. So you say 500 for timber, uh, 2K for uh, steel, and you didn't say anything about CLT. So they wonder how much. Well, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> and the, the, probably the other answer is I don't want to know. I don't want to know. So we started this journey, we started the CLT journey. Um, but what about time? So you say yeah. six months with timber frame, let's say, or six weeks at first, but with the, you know, uh, and there's another question. So the CLT actually takes time not on site maybe, but the preparation. Yeah, and that's another reason why a lot of builders don't like CLTs because a lot of builders show up on Monday morning and they scratch their head and go, what am I going to do today? Oh uh, yeah, I should have ordered that CLT about six months ago, right? So it doesn't, CLT needs a lot of planning and it doesn't suit everyone. Like I'm not, that's, that wasn't a criticism. That's just some, the way some builders work and we have to cater for everyone. So I think they want to, you, the planning of the CLT is onerous, so you've got to do shop drawings. I mean, it's the same as steel. You've got to do shop drawings. You've got to understand what the um, what the geometry is, and you, then you've got to understand the processing, and you've got to choose a manufacturer as well. So it does require a builder. So that's what I said to Andrew as well. I said it requires a builder and a CLT manufacturer to become in, come into the job early. It's got to be integrated design because it's not a commodity. Like Knut said on the other project, he said the engineer did the full design for a certain number of timber. Then the Swedish uh, engineers came in and re-engineered the whole thing, right, for their product. So it's not a commodity. So you've got to do the engineering specific to the product. So you've got to get the CLT manufacturing early. Otherwise, everyone's wasting their time. How do you get the doors to operate on that second building? Which one? How did the doors operate? The strut. So it was a Renlita, Monarch Renlita. You know Steve Jones from Monarch Renlita? He d they, do the, they do all operable doors. So there's a couple of manufacturers around. Tilt does them as well. But uh, if you talk to Steve Jones, they're st so they're big struts that operate, that operate the door. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah. Yeah, so once, it's cut, once it cuts, it is sealed. It is sealed. Um, so Walter and Sam, the builders, um, I know much more about this than I do, but it was sealed. It is under cover as well, so I don't know if you're familiar with the durability code of, um, of 1684, but it does talk about if it's fully exposed or if it's under an e protected from an eaves or if it's internal, there's three different uh, ratings that you can use for that. So this was under eaves, so it didn't need the full protection as if it's fully exposed like the rest of the the trunk of the tree, but it is sealed. Yeah. And Richard Forrester actually helped with that as well because you are cutting down to the heartwood, which is the soft bit of the, of the hardwood. So it needs to, I actually think they, and they ended up grinding some of that heartwood out in order to make sure that it was met the durability class required. Come on, I'm a wealth of knowledge. Surely you have more. So that's Richard. That's Richard's specialty. So Richard gave me criteria. There isn't. There's, I didn't even know, but there was. There is an Australian standard, standard on using trees, and it's all about um, the junctions. So the actual trunk of the tree is fine, but as soon as you get another branch that comes out, it's about calculating. So they went through and measured all of the where the where the branches are, and then I don't know if you know, but the, when a when a branch grows out of a tree, it comes. It is like a cone into the middle of the tree. And it's that cone which is the weak link. So you've got to make sure that the, the main trunk that goes up has enough left, and that's the diameter that we, well, that's the dimension that we use in order to calculate its capacity. Yeah. It's rocket science. It's rocket science. <laughs> yep. In each project, do you wait for that moment of spark or the click? Absolutely. It always happens. You don't have to, like, you don't look for it. You seriously? I honestly say you go into these meetings and you don't have to look for it, it will happen. It, 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 it'll find you. It will. It'll find you. Again, it's just like biophilia and you know, uh, you know, you think, well, surely that's all bullshit. But it's not. It's actually that moment. And 
like thinking about it, it sounds it sounds corny. Like you wait for the building to tell it tell you what it wants to be, right? That's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for it to tell. And if if it's not telling you, then you need more information. So we're sitting in, in meetings and gathering the information, layering on, layering on, understanding the client, understanding the architect, understanding all of this stuff, layering it on, and then it will reveal itself to you. It never has not revealed itself to you. I've done, what, 5,000 projects probably now? Oh God, probably more. Anyway, but they always reveal themselves to you. Some are obvious, but other ones, are, other ones, they will reveal themselves to you eventually. You just need more information if it's not telling you. Yeah. But let, the, the other thing is, uh, are we all architects here, or? Some of them are engineers. Okay. I mean, the other thing is, let, you know, I, I say the, the best way for this emergent thing to happen is to create an ecosystem where everyone trusts each other, right? It doesn't work without that. If, you, if you're in a group that's adversarial, which is normal, right? It's normal. It, it won't happen, right? The reason... I would choose a 600 deep beam instead of a 500 deep beam, right? Has nothing to do with the fact that the numbers say it should be 600 deep, nothing, right? I look around the room and saying, who's gonna screw me if I get this wrong? And if I see no one, I'll go 500. If I think that it's a high risk and people are gonna blame me if something goes wrong, right? I'm gonna choose 500. That tree, right? The reason I'm happy to do that tree is because I know that if it goes wrong, I've got 10 people who will say, don't worry about it, we'll sort it out, right? No one would ever blame me. No one would ever blame me. That's not what this is, and that's what integrated design is. You get this trusted ecosystem and everything changes, everything. I couldn't be more, well, I can't be more passionate about that. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, you know, when you get into jobs now where you don't have that, it's like, damn it, <sighs> you know? So I, I look for it everywhere. I say, let's do integrated design. Surely, get, bring a builder in early. Let's just have a party the whole time. And that's what Tari is. It's just one big party. Well, well the other thing I say is like, I, I use the word play, right? And you probably do it, I mean, as architects and engineers, play is a huge thing. I'm, I'm a huge fan of that word, uh, even though it sounds childish and juvenile. Play is a very powerful word in our industry, right? You play every day when you're exploring different options. Right? And the play is not, doesn't show up in a magazine. Right? That play does not show up. And I never ever get a job and just um, do it in a black box and then present it to the architect and say, this is this final solution. Because they're like, well, what are you talking about? How did you get to that? Right? You've got to play together. Right? And that's what integrated design is all about. You're sitting in workshops playing through the whole thing so everyone understands and everyone can contribute. Do you know that I've spent 15 years building a silo Right? Where I'm a structural engineer working in this little silo, right? And no one dare come into my silo, it's my own. And no one comes into it, and you're in your silo, and you stay in your silo. I spent 15 years of my career building that silo. I spent the last five years, thanks to Caroline Pidcock, in fact, she was a huge influence on me in this. I've spent the last five years knocking it down, and for the rest of another 50 years, I'm going to knock that silo down. There's no way we should be playing in silos. Get everyone involved. The world's too complicated now, right? Structural engineering is amazing. Architect, they're all amazingly complicated things. You can't do it by yourself, right? We've all got to work together and trust each other and work together. You know, if, the, if there's any takeaway from today, that, take away that. You've got to work together. No one's enemies here. We've all got to work together to make these things happen. Tari is a magical project, and there's only one reason for that, and that's because we're in this trusted ecosystem. To, sh to let you in on our business plan, so when we originally delved into this, we had a business plan, and that business plan was, okay, we're gonna spend 150 hours, and we, that's what we budgeted, 150 hours, to get to the point where we'd have the equivalent of AS684, the cookbook, right? We'd make the equivalent cookbook for CLT, right? After probably 1,000 hours, we weren't even close to getting that, right? Weren't even close to getting that. But we did, however, so my business plan was saying, okay, it's gonna be 150 hours, and we're gonna do 50 projects every year for the next, whatever, 25 years. That was my business plan, right? Well, it quickly, you know, turned to shit, really, right? But I love, the thing is, I'm doing it for love, right? I'm doing it because I love it, right? And I think it's the way that, I think it's what we should be doing. And I think those builders, remember, those builders who build CLT for the first time never go back. Because unlike David, right? who 
six months down the track, don't worry, we've catered for it, they realized, the builders who do CLT realized, well, just a second, this is two days and that's it, right? It's not six weeks and then, oh, maybe it's done. No, it's not, we'll keep going, we'll keep going. I have never been on a job where the timber framing has been constructed in the time frame in which they said it would be, never, never. They're fooling yourselves, but you just fool yourselves through the whole, through the whole thing. But CLT is a known. Do you know what? There's so much uncertainty. I could talk about uncertainty forever, but there's so much uncertainty in our industry. Like I said, the cost, the time, the quality, uncertain, completely uncertain. Don't let anyone tell you that they know exactly what it is, right? But the thing about CLT is I know that's going to get installed in two days because it's 15 minutes per panel and there's 50 panels. It's two days, right? It's, it's a known. In, the, in a world of complete ridiculous unknowns, which is the construction industry, it's a known. Like if you can pinpoint things down as a builder, that's all you want to know. And the other thing is that we also want to know, because one of the biggest costs on, what's the one of the biggest costs on site? If I'm a builder on site, what's the biggest cost? What's the thing that I want to avoid the most? Rework, Rework? Rework? yeah, sure. Rework? Any, anything else? Labor? Yeah, labor, but labor can be a known. Labor can be a known. But the, the one thing I say is you don't ever want anything to leave the site, right? because it's just money that you're throwing away. So you don't want things to leave the site. CLT, nothing leaves the site. Everything comes in and nothing ever leaves, right? That bear, you know, that, and the, you know the cost of these tips, the, the bins? They've, they've gone from $50 to a mixed bin is now, what, 450 bucks? Any builders here? They, they probably know better. Like the, that, those bins are just, yeah, you don't want anything going in that bin. You want it to be empty, the whole build. So, so from a sustainability point of view, that's what you want as well. You don't want anything leaving your site. Bring it in and keep it in, right? And back in the old days, they used to bury it on the front porch. You know, my front porch has dead bodies probably buried under there and you don't want anything to leave the site, right? All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome.